Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 338 for Monday, February 21st, 2022. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in the Pomo, California, it's Paul Kent. <laughs> I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> so we had a uh, we had a technical glitch where we only recorded half of the show, and it was just me. So for 10 minutes. So this is our second go at this Not today. There's anything wrong with that. Well, <laughs> may, some people may prefer that. And I, I think, think a greater simple. number of people would uh, actually prefer the opposite. So uh, here we are the second time. And the first time in Paul matched my cadence with my thing. And I, uh, I have the same comment to say, I think if you start matching my cadence or if I start matching your cadence with this, uh, it's only going to go downhill. <laughs> I don't, I don't think I could keep it up for very long anyway. So I don't even know how I do it. So, you know, it's, uh, it's just how it is, but, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, uh, I'm here in Durham, New Hampshire at the moment. I'm heading to Mexico on, on Wednesday. It, it seems like when we booked these tickets for this trip back in July, uh, and many times since then, including even like a week ago, I thought there was great chances that this trip would be canceled, but it doesn't seem like it will be. Seems like COVID. Yeah, yeah, COVID. Right. Yes. It, it, this is the um, the fish does their thing down in Mexico uh, in every winter, and so we are going again. Uh, but uh, but yeah, it's been it's been a, a crazy evolution as COVID has evolved. So have the specifics about this trip you know when they when they first booked it i i don't think there were any uh hard and fast covid restrictions you know they 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 made some comments about you know those we will let you know what those are when you know as when it matters effectively and then i think it was december when they came out and said for this and it's a company called cid entertainment that puts this together with the resort and with fish and, uh, and does it for some other bands. I, I think this past weekend, Dave Matthews and Tim Reynolds were there. They do it for the grateful or the, uh, the dead and company with, uh, and they do, they're doing a thing with Hootie and I don't know. Anyway, they do it with a bunch of bands, but they, they'd said for this, at least for the fish weekend and for a couple others, vaccinations would be required. And if you watch the news, it wouldn't surprise you to learn that there were people that said, well, I'm not, you know, that that's not okay by me. I'm canceling. So these, this non-refundable thing had to offer people the opportunity to cancel. So that happened in December, which brought into question, like if too many people cancel, well, are they, is it going to be worth it to, you know, to do the thing? And then like two weeks ago, the CDC said Mexico was at level four for COVID or whatever, um, I think it, if they don't do the U.S. because we're not a foreign country to the U.S., but I think the U.S. would be at like level six or seven compared to Mexico's level four. But uh, CID had said, well, if Mexico hits level four, then uh, we will offer refunds. And so that happened two and a half weeks ago or something. And so it was like, oh, well, you know, how many people are going to cancel, uh, you know, again, They've got this, they've got to have some minimum number where it's below which it's like, mm, I don't think we're going to do this. So, mm -hmm. and then, you know, all it would take is one band member testing positive and yeah. like that would, you know, like that's the end of that. Right. Like, yep. so there's, there, that has existed all the way through that, you know, that particular risk. So, um, yeah. So anyway, but it looks like we're going to luck. Yeah. Thanks. I hope it happens. Yeah. A month ago. After we we had, I think I mentioned it on the show, but we in in on COVID came through and visited our home about five or six weeks ago. And after that, it was like, okay, we're definitely going to be going to Mexico, you know, or somewhere that warm that week. Mm -hmm. If it's not this, that's fine. There's plenty of other places to go. You know, we've already got flights. We're good to go. And uh, we had, I did buy travel insurance and all that stuff, obviously. But um, yeah. So anyway, 
I don't know cool. if that's interesting to listen to. I think the conversation that didn't get recorded was probably more interesting. But we'll you know, try again. We'll try yeah, that again we'll someday. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All good. For sure. Yeah. We um are, go ahead. Are you gonna go to um McCartney in June in Boston? Um I don't I'm not I don't know if I am going to be on the East Coast in uh, that on that day in June. Got it. Um we've got some like college move out and graduation stuff. That's all sort of swirling around there, including a potential family trip that's been delayed two years and things like that. So I, I don't know. And I'm kind of bummed about it because you would go. Oh, uh, w without question. Yeah. 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 I I'll go see McCartney until I don't enjoy the show and I'm okay. I, I think he will tour past the point where he 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 should stop I, I i mean i could be wrong about this but he has had tours you know 10 15 years ago where his voice was not great things you know it was like mm, maybe he should be done and then like he figured something out and maybe changed the way he was taking care of his health or his throat or like who knows maybe stop smoking weed i don't know i have no idea but whatever it took like the Did last lower keys um he has not done, to my knowledge, he has not done that yet. Um, but he, I mean, maybe he he has said he's like, well, that's the key the song's in. He's like, that's why we sing it in that key. So I don't know, but you know, um, my guess is there will be a time if I see Paul every time he tours. My guess is there will be a time where it's like, ah, okay, well, this was the last one. I'm okay with that. You know, I've seen yeah. some fantastic McCartney shows. And if I see a stinker, like it won't ruin the fact that I saw some fantastic ones. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's yeah. kind of how I look at that. So I would go. Or is he coming anywhere near you? He, well, I'm in between two big places. So he's coming both to Oakland in right. May and Los Angeles in May. So I'm straight between those two things. Yes, you are. <laughs> so I need to figure that out. Yeah. That saw was... him once and took the whole family. And actually that was, I mean, seeing Paul was great. But listening to a Beatles sing Beatles songs with my young daughters was really the, that was the thing. Yep. We, I, I totally know what you mean. We brought three generations of Hamiltons. One time we went and yeah. saw them and it was like, yeah, I mean, nothing gets better than this. We did the same yep. thing with the Beach Boys 10 years ago. The last time Brian Wilson toured with the Beach Boys. And, and there was a moment looking, you know, kind of down the aisle where I saw my dad and my kids and me, you know, all singing along to Sloop John B. And it was like, Okay, this is actually pretty cool. Like, I actually am very curious about that. I, I, the Beach Boys in my mind are this very confusing thing to understand who's in, who's out, yeah. how how politically oriented they are, how you know how you know how many original members are there. I have no sense at all as what harmony the Beach Boys put not vocal harmony, I understand. but just yeah. human harmony the, the Beach Boys put on stage at any one time. Yeah, I. I Yes, it, it is always a question every time they tour <laughs> my my because I, I have the same question. It's like, oh, if I could go see that again, I would because it was Mike Love, I think Al Jardine, uh, Brian Wilson. And uh, was there anybody else? Was would there, you have gone if Brian Wilson wasn't part of the show? I don't think so. I mean, I wouldn't yeah. be I wouldn't go out of my way to go if, you know, if it came up, it was day of the show and somebody's like, hey, I have tickets. Would you go? I'm like, yeah, of course, you know, it's going to be fine. They're going to put on a good show. I mean, that band, it, you know, that band hasn't been the same since John Stamos left. Let's let's be perfectly honest about this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I can't. I can't help it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was it was it was a great show. Most of the the vocal harmonies were covered by Brian Wilson's band. He had mm -hmm. several of his the the, the people, and I forget the name of the the band that he essentially hired to go in like when he redid uh, smile and, or when he finally did smile. Wait, it was like an that. existing band that he took in mass or he put a band together. No, I, I, as I understand it, he took a band and, and effectively joined them or, or hired them or, you know, whatever you want to call it. it. Uh, but yeah, though the, and I, I was not prepped for this conversation, so I don't have the name of the band or certainly the members of the band, but the, you know, it's a lot of, not all, but a lot of the kind of signature Brian Wilson harmonies were sung by that guy, uh, you know, from the the band mm -hmm. that, that he brought in and that guy was touring with them. 
And I, I mean, it sounded fantastic. It was, you know, it was great. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was, it was good. So I would, I would, I would go out of my way to see him again with Brian Wilson. Sure. Why not? I don't know that. I don't think it'll happen, but I, you know, yeah. who knows? Like, I didn't think yeah. we'd have a pandemic either. That was super wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Super wrong. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we had a conversation last week, Paul, uh, catalyzed by our discussion about the Super Bowl. We had a conversation about how does it work? Does it work to fit rap songs into your cover band set? You know, so not not writing and singing your own rap songs, uh, but covering other people's very popular rap songs. And there's a great conversation happening about this on our Facebook group. So if you go to giggabpodcast.com slash Facebook, you can see a lot of what's been said there and, uh, and of course, contribute yourself, which is amazing. We did get a couple of emails about it that I think are representative of two, I'll call them sides, two perspectives on this. I don't think anybody's arguing here. Uh, in fact, I think the conversations have been very productive, but it's been, it's been interesting. Shane, wrote and said uh, in reference to your discussing uh, discussion about covering rap songs, he, uh, I have this video that Adam Neely did on the subject. And he, he sent this, uh, sent us this YouTube video, which we have linked in the show notes at giggabpodcast.com. He says it touches on how rappers don't cover other rappers parallels between quoting jazz solos and quoting rap verses and why there seems to be a rash of acoustic guitar covers of rap on YouTube. Uh, Shane goes on to say, I personally love the parallels between jazz solos and rap verses. You wouldn't go up at a jam session and just play one of Charlie Parker's solos note for note out of the Omni book. But quoting a Miles Davis lick in the context of your own solo is fine. It's about the authenticity and expressing yourself honestly. And this was one of the first emails we got in about this. And, and this resonated with me after we had the discussion, which was also a discussion I wasn't prepped for. So I hadn't really even put any thought into it. Uh, I started thinking the same thing, y you know, it, it, the lyrics, generally speaking, rap lyrics uh, are so personal that I was having trouble, you know, putting my head around finding a tune that might actually work to cover. You know, we talked about hot in here and rapper's delight. Uh, and I think maybe those might be more the exceptions than the rule of, you know, this this Venn diagram of rap songs that work when they're covered by people that that didn't write them. Um, but I, I, I found the, this interesting isn't the rap, the lyrics themselves, the thing that people are connected to. That's the thing. But they're usually very personal. They, they're they're delivered. Um, and that, it's not to say that some many rock and roll lyrics aren't personal, uh, but rap seems to be largely more first person personal than than most you know rock and roll so i'm just going to raise the flag here that this conversation all of a sudden it just got really weird like huh. is it any different you know like like dicing that rap has some different place in the in the replication like it makes it uncoverable i mean if you can't if you can't sing the lyrics are you covering the song, right? Right. I, I, I don't really understand what, what the distinction is because we certainly got a lot of a lot of feedback saying, no, oh, people love it. Their house goes crazy. You know, people sing along. They rap along with us. And so I'm not understanding the distinction that rap, because the lyrics are personal, all lyrics are personal to a, to a degree, right? Uh, yes. The, the However, many lyrics can be interpreted different ways. Like when you write a song, you mean it you know, to you, it means something very specific, general. It might, it might, right? I mean, it might not, right? You might write something that's super esoteric and, you know, observational. But uh, it's possible you would write a song that, you know, means something very specific to you. And when you put it out in the world, people hear that and put themselves in it, right? Like mm -hmm. there's a lot of, of poetry and, and lyrics where that's the case. And certainly there there is some some rap where that's the case, but by and large, you know, the, the point that, that Shane was sharing here and the point that, you know, Adam Neely was making in the video is that they are so uh, perhaps uniquely personal that much of it does not lend itself to being sung by the person who sung by someone who didn't write it. Right. Um, and that it's, it's a, a, 
uh, it, perhaps, you know, a way of saying it is it's a way of testifying, right? It's, it's, you know, a lot of these lyrics are super personal. And, and so does it make sense for you to tell someone else's story? Right. Mm. And, and I think, I think that's where Shane and, and Adam Neely were going, but to your point, right? Like we got plenty of emails and the, the one that we got from James is, is a, a perfect example. He says, uh, I'm the guitarist vocalist for the band Groove Nation. And in response to episode 337, I wanted to touch base with you about rap music and cover bands as rap songs are a fairly big part of what we do. And it really works for us. He says, it's funny that you mentioned Baby Got Back and California Love specifically because those are the two big crowd pleasers. Um, but there are quite a few others that we do. The trick, he says, is to do them unironically and own them just like any other song. No apologies. Which kind of goes... A which goes against what Shane was saying. Yeah, yeah, it's two perspectives on this. That's right. Yeah, no yeah. apologies. No, well, sort of, right? But like, we're we're selecting the songs that that work, right? That that aren't quite so personal. That are just sort of more adaptable to a different singer. He says, uh, "No apologies, no disclaimers. Just hit them with it." Uh, and he yeah. gave he gave us a few examples of some videos, and I I, I watched a couple. The California Love and Baby Got Back are there. Wild Ones is on there. Uh, but you know, those are perhaps m less specific to the singer and more just singing about, you know, something pr a little more objective and, and perhaps that's the, perhaps that's the key, but yeah, I mean, the people are, he's totally right. Watching some of these videos, I'll, I'll put some in the show notes if you folks want to watch them. Uh, it's, and I hope I hope I'm okay doing that, James, please tell me if I'm not. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, the crowd is 100% into them, dancing, singing along, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's and, and the covers are pretty straight covers. They aren't like what Adam Neely was talking about with the, you know, acoustic guitar sort of adaptations of them. These are fairly straight covers, uh, you know, that that sound enough like the original that that people can just sing along to what they already know in their heads. And it it works, you know, like most cover songs. Right. Like, you know, the, yeah. that sort of adaptation. So, yeah, this is it was fascinating to uh, to see your examples, uh, not just James, but everybody else that sent in examples of your bands doing these songs. Like, yeah, they're, they're clearly are, are songs that work. Um, not all of them, but, but yeah. enough I, I, that you can put them in your set. This conversation is just so interesting. Somebody I think uh, Tim Allen had said, you know, like, what was it? The Super Bowl? That is classic music now. That is not recent oh, yeah. music, right? Right, no. And, yeah. you know, in the sense of what we're trying to do as entertainers in a, in, a, in a cover band, again, depending upon what your goals are. I mean, if you're, you know, if your goal is to appeal to as many people so you can get booked as much as possible, if you have a business approach, you know, I, I know the arguments always come into us. This is my art and my art is classic rock. And, you know, that, that's, what, that's what I feel and that's what I do. I totally get that. Um, but uh, the whole it was an interesting discussion because what happened at the Super Bowl, I was like, hmm, I've heard of these people. You know, I know that they're big in their in their field, but I would never, I don't know any of these songs. And, and then I'm watching kind of the energy build and I'm like, oh, there's definitely something there. That's kind of why I said we should talk about this on the show. Yeah. And, you know, the feedback is, is kind of like eye-opening. It's like, yes, if your job is to cover the canon of, of great musical party songs, you really can't not do these types of things if you want to be all inclusive in the types of music and you know broad in terms of the audience. The other thing about hip hop that's really interesting, uh, think about it. It um, it's it's an inclusive art form. Like classic rock existed at a time where there was classic rock and there was you know hard funk, you know disco, right? And typically people align themselves with. I don't know if you'll agree with this. People, you know, that was their Bible, right? You know, so if you were a, a rock and roll fan, you listened to the rock and roll station, there wasn't much funk, there wasn't much disco, you lived in that type of stuff. Sure. If you're a disco guy, if you're, a, you know, a, a funk guy, an R&B guy, those were different things. And people, yeah, you know, there are always people who are like, I like all music, but certainly for many people, they're passionate about a certain genre of the music. Hip hop comes about at a time and youth of all cultural makeups you know, that was their music, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's fair. Yeah. It, it definitely crossed a lot of lines that were not that, 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 yeah. Previous styles had not really crossed. You're right. Totally. Yeah. So yeah, I, I enjoyed the conversation because it definitely opened my eyes. 
you know, we dabbled in some stuff. It it tiptoed towards ironic. Look at the look at the older white guys playing hip hop. Sure. But like I, I think I've said to you before, our bass player was like really into rapping, and he you know he he was into it. So he kind of gave it a much more of a reality. I think the other guys in stage were watching Steve emote authentically, and we thought it was fun. Sure. But I wouldn't say that everybody on stage had a universal experience to to feeling that music that was going on at that time. Sure. So you know, yeah. I, I, that, that's that's useful to me. A, it is part of musical canon. B, um, uh, it needs to be treated with the same reverence that any other type of music you would play would be treated. Yeah, and I, I liked the, I liked what James said about that. Just you know, just play the song. You, you know, you yeah. don't you don't give a disclaimer. It will take care of business. Yeah, just go. You don't give a disclaimer when you go play. You know, Jesse's Girl or uh, or you know, or Sweet Home Alabama. You just play the song, and that's right. going to be true with with the rest of the stuff. Yeah, if you if you start. Telling if you start if you spoon feed your audience a reason to question what you're about to do, I'm guessing they're more likely to question what you're about to do. In fact, I'm certain yeah. of it because I've made that mistake before. Um, yeah, yeah, we make that mistake on this show all the time. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We would love to hear your thoughts about any of the stuff we discuss or any of the stuff we haven't discussed that you would like us to discuss or even. If you have something that you don't want us to share on the show, but you have a question or a thought, tell us that too. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We love to hear from you. Hey, before we jump into a conversation, I know we've been sitting on the kind of fun thread we had with Dan East for a while, yeah. but I just wanted to, I wanted to share a little bit about my last weekend of, of gigs. Yeah, right? man. So I had uh, what was supposed to be my first trio gig down here in my new area. So, the, you know, the background I've been sharing, I hadn't intended to put anything together and just do solo down here. And I have a band up in Northern California. That's my band. But down here, you know, especially as my guys in Northern California getting busy and other types of things, I have time down here. And uh, one of the venues that I've been a regular at had said, hey, we like what you're doing. We're going to be doing, you know, more, bigger, bigger things on the weekends. Do you have a group? Me being the enterprising person that I am, I said, absolutely, I have a group. And then I went ahead and found a group, right? Yeah. So uh, uh, I, I got a bass player and a, and a drummer. Um, the process to getting a drummer was a little bit interesting in that I met with a guy who's really well-known, re well-regarded drummer down here. He gave me a list of six people. I, he said, and this is the order that I would call him. I called the first guy on that list, and it was... A bit of a challenge conversation. First, he didn't want to do it for the money. Then I got the money up. And then he took a couple of days to tell me he didn't want to do it for the distance. It was about a 45-minute drive. And I was just kind of fed up, you know, yeah. trying yeah. to get the cool kids to, you know, take a gig, right? Yeah, no no so, twice tells me there's, it's probably going to be a no the third time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so and I wasn't going to, you know, I wasn't going to be at the whims of, of a side man, right? Sure. So, uh, it turns out there's a guy who lives close to me who we ran in the same circles up in Northern California. He lives down here as well. He's a good drummer. I called him. He said, yeah, I'm around. Let's, let's make some music. Really easy. Oddly enough, I found a bass player on Craigslist. So I'll take a peek at Craigslist. Not a lot of traffic down here on that, but this one guy did it. He said enough things that kind of resonated with me, you know, his station in life, you know, the music he listened to. Yeah. I invited him over, gave him five songs to learn, came over, nice guy, prepared, you know, did did a super job. I said, okay, this is some guy I can use. We rehearsed twice. Um, I sent them a list of about 25 songs. We rehearsed twice, broke up the list into two. And we're getting ready to do this, this first gig. Day before the first gig, drummer gets very sick. Oh, no. Didn't know if it was COVID at the time, but he sure. said he was really, really sick. Sure. So I, you know, he's not gonna be able to make the gig. I call the venue. I say, hey, um, my drummer's real sick. Can I do it as a duo? They were like, absolutely. Just you know, come have fun. So me and the bass player did the gig together. However, I also tried to get a sub for this uh, for this drummer, right? Sure. So I called the first guy who gave me the list of, of local drummers. Didn't call the same guy from, from the first time. But anyway, total, I got a list of about 10 drummers between some nice local guys who gave me a list of people. That's great. Six had the courtesy to call me back and say, oh, I would, but, you know, I'm, I'm booked, I'm busy, booked already or, yeah. or not available, right? Yeah. Four never even gave the courtesy to call back, which really ticked me off. And um, 
when I left the message for all of them, I absolutely name dropped, you know, I got your name from so-and-so. I would think that you would just not want to do a disservice to someone who was kind enough to give you a referral and the courtesy of a text back or a call back to say, hey, thanks, but I can't do it. So those four people in the lesson of the interconnected to th- uh, interconnectedness of things, I will never call again. Like I immediately, I'm, I'm going I'm to put them on the list, you know, didn't even have the courtesy to confirm or deny with me. So I'm not going to say that they're, they're worth a call again. So the title of the episode is holds a grudge like Khomeini, right? That could be. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I actually think it's the interconnectedness of things. And so then interestingly Yeah, no, I, I I get it. I I get what you're saying. Yeah. I, uh, I, I might give people, you never, you don't know somebody's story, right? That, like, that's the, that's where I start with these things. So if someone, you know, if this happens, okay, fine. Note, noted. You know, leave them a message the next time they call me back. Okay, great. Like, you know, if they acknowledge that they heard from me and didn't call me back, we can have that conversation. If they don't, well, okay, like whatever. Things happen. Uh, I've certainly missed returning phone calls in my life. You know, so like I wouldn't take me. I wouldn't take one no or one, you know, call into the ether. It's possible the voicemail never even made it. Right. Like, you know, I it's it. a technology. So I, I tend to give people the benefit of the doubt. I don't know. I, I, I've, I've had a lot of success in scenario. I've been surprised by scenarios where I've had success, where I would have, expected. I know you, and I know this is the way that you think, and you know me and you know, this is the way <laughs> I think, right? Like, yeah. like, like, you know, life's short. Yeah. I'm not going to nurse someone along. Oh, no, no, just, no. You know, do well. No, you're not going to beg you know, them, but uh, you know, a second phone call, like it doesn't hurt. Like, it's not like they, they called you back and told you, screw that guy. Or you heard them say that to somebody, you know, it's like, I you, get don't, it. you don't know. Yeah. I, I don't but, know. You know, my, uh, now my list has seven people and you know, I, uh, that any gig that I have, if I can't get it done with seven people on the list, I'm, you know, I'm not going to look any further. Right. Sure. So anyway, Again, the interconnectedness of things. So the bass player and I do the gig. It goes, it goes fine. You know, again, it's a little weird just a bass player and guitar player when you have rehearsed, assuming there was going to be yeah. a groove, right? So, yep. but the, you know, the bass player did a really solid job preparing. You know, was a pleasure to play with. People liked it, and you know, for the environment that it was, it still worked pretty well. And uh, the the venue was happy with it, and you know, so no no one died, no murder, no foul. On we go, right? Other than so, the guys that didn't and, call you back. They're dead to you. Well, they're off. They're the dead. That's yeah, right. off. And again, we're ta- I'm, the point of all this Sorry. is the internet interconnectedness of things. So, so uh, the, the the their action or inaction causes an, a, a a tumbling down effect, right? Yep. Now we go to Sunday and I do a, a solo gig. Solo gig uh, goes fine. Kind of a cold day, but you know, kind of a nice place, nice thing. Not a ton of people there. Anyway, I'm walking out. I'm unpacked up. I leave out, and there's a guy who comes up to me. And says, "Hey." I, you know, it was a golf course gig. He goes, hey, I caught you from the golf course. I listened to one or two from the side. I heard you from inside the bar. You're great. I own a really nice bar in downtown. Love you to come play. Do you have a trio? (laughs) (laughs) And so, (laughs) so, uh, you know, more gigs happen, right? And that's, that's, I think this is the thing, you know, musician conversations are, are weird to me. I have had to relearn a lot about human nature, right? I started out leading a band, assuming I could take my day job business skills and apply that to running a band. Learned a lot of really hard lessons, got hit over the head many, many times with the reality that that's not a very solid assumption in in many cases, right? Um, However, the one that I still live with is is be a cool person, right? Be a a decent dude or woman. Um, And uh, that that is foundational to any kind of interaction in life because opportunities come opportunities go you can never have too many friends yep. um, identify the person who's a creator versus the person who is a like if your life is to be a side man you are dependent upon people who go get gigs getting gigs so you can get called be you know i would think if you're a side man you want to be as as considerate and impressive to as many of those people who are out making the work possible for you as as, as possible so yeah that's yeah, if you've never, I, I, I think this is a place where certainly lessons I've learned in business uh, very much intersect is it's difficult to not put yourself in someone else's shoes or, or maybe, maybe the right analogy is 
to not put your shoes on someone else, right? And and the reason I make that distinction is the person who is a perpetual, you know, sideman in this in this scenario that that you've created here has not done the work of booking gigs, right? They've done the work of a sideman, which is totally different and not necessarily any easier or harder, right? It's just a different set of time and time invested, right? You know, as the sideman, you got to learn somebody else's tunes. You have to be adaptable with your schedule to a whim. If you don't call somebody back, the, you know, you're dead to them. Like that, that whole <laughs> thing, right? No, I'm serious. Like, like this is that, that, per, that person's world. And so, you know, when, and, and it's entirely possible, I don't recommend anybody does this, but it's entirely possible that that side man might see themselves as the savior of the gig bookers out there, right? Like, you know, like, hey, you booked a gig, but you don't have anybody to play it. I got you. I saved you, right? I came in and played this gig. And there's definitely been gigs where I've been called as a last minute sub or something where, you know, they can't stop thanking me throughout the night, you know, and if you take that too seriously, you start to think that the gig was all about you. It wasn't, you know, but you could think that. And so I would I would just say, you know, expecting people to understand a job they've never done is going to be perhaps a an exercise in frustration should we all be thankful and appreciative and uh, compassionate to one another well i hate to say what any of us should do but i think that's what we should do uh but it, it it's it lacks understanding right like there's no way you know what somebody else is like like i said before you don't know somebody you don't we don't know everybody's story so um it's it's Yes, it's frustrating when people are not appreciative in, of the things that we do, but they might not know the things that we do. Yeah. I think that's the, that's the, that's the lesson from my, you know, condescending elitist throne for today. Maybe that's the right way to say it, which is, which is a place right I, sh on. I shouldn't sit. That's right. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bad place to sit for me. Long may you reign. It's a, it's a, you said long may I reign. I, I heard lonely may you reign. <laughs> so, you know, be careful what you wish for. I, I, again, if a side man has a savior syndrome, I think that's a, that's a professional liability. Right? Oh, you, I, I agree. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. no, no, no. That, that was, <laughs> that was not the point of my thing, but like it, it, it's, it's taking what does happen to an extreme, right? Like, you know, the side man last minute, you know, I, I was called on Friday, maybe Friday, two weeks ago. Now, I don't know. The days all blur together, man. Um, but I was calling, you know, a couple of Fridays ago, uh, my friend texted me and he's like, um, I, I, I need to be careful not to share mm, the personal information. But anyway, it was, I can't do five gigs this weekend. Can you cover for me? Uh, and it was like, wow, no, you know, like I can't, but had I said yes, uh, I guarantee you I would have walked in there and everybody, any mistake I made would have been forgiven. Uh, any, you, you know, anything would be like, it would be, oh, thank goodness. You saved the day, Dave. You saved the day. And, you know, it's like, it's how that goes because people are thankful. I, if I was, you know, one of the other people on that gig and we had to bring someone in that was going to either be the make or break for us being able to to do those, sh those shows, then, I, you know, I would be thankful to them too. But yeah. you could take that to an extreme where it's like, you know, okay, you know, and honestly, that was part of it. It was like, well, I really don't want to give up my entire weekend to do this, but it sure would make those people happy, you know, like, okay, well, I get to go be Superman like that. That's cool. Like, but it's really not worth it. Um, you know, so I didn't do it. But, um, and also I had a couple of things like it, I would have had to move stuff out of the way to, you know, to free myself up for an entire weekend. At, at, you know, 11 a.m. on a Friday morning or something like it's it was a little too late. But but you could get savior syndrome and that. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. That's not the. That's not good. I don't think there's too many people out there that get that other than me, because, you know, condescending <laughs> elitist jackass. Right. That's but I have a shirt. It's fine. Everybody knows it's, it's OK. No, I really don't try to be too condescending or elitist. The jackass parts hard, though. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's tough for me.
Uh, I do want to start this conversation, though, about uh, that that uh, Daniel East sent in. Daniel East is we call him Danny sometimes. Uh, he goes by Daniel East professionally. So we will use the name interchangeably. It refers to the same human. Dan has been on the show a few times. He is sound engineer, uh, in-ear monitor, uh, expert, drummer, great human, educator, extraordinaire. Uh, he sent in a note to us and he says, uh, as you may know, I record every gig. I make sure that if I'm mixing, I get a board recording in some fashion. And if I'm playing and can't copy the board mix or sometimes even when I can, I use the Rode IXY on either microphone on either my iPad or iPhone. The Rode IXY is a lightning connector microphone stereo XY pattern, uh, which is why they named it that. And fairly high quality mic, and you can get decent recordings out of this. He says, I love this stereo mic and have both the lightning and 30 pin versions. So the 30 pin would have been the old connectors for iPads. Even with their proprietary software, sometimes I need a little bit more control of the mic's levels. So I'm trying out new mics uh, and I'm trying one from a brand I've, a, a brand I'd not heard of until now. He says, so. I want to ask, what choices do I have for this purpose? And this is where our gig gab community can, we can help each other. Cause I know Dan's not the only one out there recording his gigs. Uh, he's so again, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Bearing in mind, Dan continues. I am usually recording higher SPL stuff by my drums. He's a drummer. So if he's going to put a mic up on stage, it's going to be near him. Uh, and he says, you know, or I'm recording at front of house at, you know, somewhere in that 90 to 100 dB peak. Uh, and there seem to be only four XY type stereo mics for iPhones that are plug and play for on device mounting. And that is one of the things about that Rode IXY is you just put it on, it clips onto the device and you're good to go. He says, and maybe that's not a good thing since the case has to be removed. Uh, yes, I've considered a full proper interface and all that. But it's not convenient on the fly. Plus, it means more stuff to carry around and set up, and that's not helpful. So the options that he came up with are, of course, this Rode IXY, the Shure MV88, uh, which he says he wasn't blown away by, but it's not terrible. I would actually agree with that. The MV88's all right. Uh, the Zoom IQ6, he says, same feeling. He says, and now this new one that I mentioned, which is the MOOU RHK26, which Dan says I've never seen nor heard of until very recently. He says, uh, I didn't reach out to the manufacturer or ask around. I pulled the trigger and we'll, sh we'll see how it goes. And he kind of, he, he didn't find that it beat the road IXY in terms of quality in the conversations that we've had following up. So the, 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 the question is um, what does work for all of you? Uh, I, I, like I said, I've tried, I have the IXY, I don't record every gig. I probably should now that I'm thinking about it because I literally have this thing sitting right here. So I, maybe I should just bring it and do it. Um, the MV88, I've tried. It gets a little crunchy when the uh, the SPL levels get high. Um, and those are the only two that I've used. I did. I did. You. I used to use an old Zoom H4, which is a standalone recorder. You know, it's uh, and they've got different versions of it now. But that's got an XY pattern mic on the front of it, or you can bypass that and just plug in, you know, whatever. Or you can do both. I think it it had a, a you know the ability to record four tracks, uh, and so I I've used that over the years, and that can be pretty good. The trick, as Dan was alluding to, that I found is you have to really be specifically careful setting your input levels, because most of these things, either in software, if it's a you know, an iPhone connected mic or in the, the software of the hardware on like a zoom have a limiter or a compressor that will take high SPL levels and, you know, and, and bring them down so that you're not overloading your recording, but too much compression, as we all know, can start to make things kind of pump and hiss. So it's getting those input levels set to where you're not just constantly running up against that limiter or compressor that you're only hitting it in sort of the, you know, uh, the, the edge case scenarios, and then it, mm -hmm. then it'll sound a little better. You have a little more headroom and a little more breath in the, in the sound. So, so I've used, uh, the zoom products. I've used okay. the H six N. Yep. Which is the six channel thing, but it has six, the X, Y mic on top. Six channel version of the zoom H four. It's just the one of the newer yep. things. Yep. 
Yep. And then I also less happy with it is that Zoom Q2N, the little camera that comes. Okay. It's it's uh it's got some problems with the camera part that I found. Like it just cuts off recordings, which is you know, you have one job, right? So, <laughs> uh, but the audio has been actually pretty de- decent on the on the on the microphone construction they have it. And you know, that's 187 bucks and yeah. Zoom. But Zoom products seem to be a little bit lower price point than some of the other traditional manufacturers that you might think about, uh, and well made and and well well regarded. They they seem to have oh yeah um, yeah. So, yeah, there I, anyway. I found you know the 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 I've used a couple different Zooms over Zoom products over the years, but the you know the H four was a workhorse for me for a while, and mm-hmm. it. Like it, it is super roadworthy. Like I, I would not have any issue going and I probably haven't used it in a couple of years, but going and grabbing it out of my bag and just going and relying on it at a gig. Like I, I have no doubt that it still works. It, you know, it, it like that thing, that thing's a workhorse. And, and it sounds like that's the case with, um, you know, with the, with the other ones you've used too, which is, well, that's great news. Yeah. 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 So, but it will be interesting to hear what other people are using because, you know, hopefully we hear everybody's recording their gigs and learning something from, you know, whatever goes on in their gigs to share with their, make their bands better. But it'd be interesting to hear what people are using. Yeah, I'd love to know. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Uh, yeah. And thank you for starting this conversation, Dan. This is a, it's a good one. And it's, I think it's one where we can all benefit from the hive mind. So are the, know. are the built in mics in the latest version, like the iPhone 13s, are they, significantly different than the previous versions? Yeah, it started. I mean, I wouldn't say that it's different from the 12 in my experience. And it might not even be all that different from the 11, but starting with the 11 series iPhones, they like there was yet another sort of plateau of audio quality and ability to deal with high SPL levels. We've seen with bitter pill, we've had quite a few iPhone recordings that, uh, that, you know, fans have done for us at gigs and sent to us. And they're just, I mean, it's phenomenal. The mm-hmm. sound that, that you can get out of these things. So, yeah, I, I think there is, um, I haven't tried, I have, I have put my iPhone here at the house, you know, recording myself at my drums. Like when we did the Macworld all-star band stuff. So that would have been an iPhone 12 last year mm-hmm. when we did it. I used my phone to record, the some of the video that that got that you know made it in there. Obviously, it also recorded audio that I didn't use. Uh, we had you know because we had multi track audio to use. But listening to that audio right on top of my drums, it's a little crunchy. Uh, it's not terrible, but it's certainly not something I would want to release or probably even listen to for several hours. You know, you get I mean, there's too much distortion, even if it's mild distortion, if it's too mm-hmm. frequent. You get, I get hearing fatigue real fast. We all do. I notice it because I'm a pain in the neck about that stuff. Remember I said, you know, jackass, right? So there you go. But um, yeah, yeah, uh, it, it's, it's better. And certainly from the distance where someone would be in the crowd and not like right on top of a snare drum, which can peak yeah. at, you know, 110, 120 dB or something, then it, then it works out all right. Yeah, it sounds really good. So all right. well, yeah. feedback. At getgebpodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. We love hearing from you. So thank you to everybody that, that wrote in this week. You you wrote the show, especially since Paul and I didn't record the first topic we talked about. We'll revisit that at some point. It was not something we planned to talk about, uh, but it was about cultivating a relationship with your audience. So we'd actually love to hear from you about that. And you can catalyze us actually having that conversation in a way that we'll share with you, uh, that we're able to share with you. So. Yeah. You got anything else for today, man? Or are we uh No, it was good to do one and a half shows today. Yeah. <laughs> it was only nine minutes that we didn't get recorded. <laughs> I will point that out. We caught it early on, but yeah, it was one segment. So all right, folks. Well, thank you for listening. Thanks for writing in feedback at giggabpodcast.com. In case you didn't know. What's that thing we say, Paul? Always. Always we were recording? No, no, no. Always be performing. <laughs> I resemble that remark. 